with you today. I'm Denise Masral, a professor in North between the Center for Policy Research in Energy and Environment in SPIA and Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, I've known Toby now probably for close to maybe 10 years, five to 10 years, based on some early work he did, earlier work he did looking at financing by multilateral development banks of overseas um, energy projects. And um, since then, I've visited you at UTH Zurich, and he is now here at Princeton for this semester and welcomes um, outreach from people who'd like to speak with him. Um, he's a recently tenured professor at UTH Zurich and um, serves as director of the Institute of Science, Technology, and Policy there. In his research, he analyzes the interaction of energy policy and its underlying politics with technological change in the energy sector. His research covers low to high income countries, and um, in his teaching, he's received the ETH Zurich Student Golden Owl Prize. Um, he also teaches in the executive teaching program there. He um, has a master's in electrical engineering from the Technical University of Munich and a PhD from ETH Zurich in management technology and economics. He did a postdoc at ETH and was a visiting scholar at Stanford in the Precourt Energy Efficiency Center, and he's been a consultant for the United Nations Development Program. Um, he's an elected member of the Swiss Academy of Engineering Sciences and serves on the editorial board of Energy Research and Social Science. Um, he's a great asset. I'm really delighted that you're here and look forward to your talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks uh, for coming. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the key technology race. And uh, that's something really, really important. It's also something really good that this is going on. Um, but the question is, who will win this race? And it's not just one technology or one firm, but it's going to be many, because we'll need a lot of technologies um, to replace existing technologies. Why is this um, interesting? I think this is interesting for people who are for investors or companies who develop these technologies, but it's also really interesting from a policy perspective. And um, I want to I want to give this policy perspective primarily, and um, I want to show how models can inform policy makers or decision makers um, to design policies in what I call a technology smart fashion. So just quickly on my on my group and overview, we're very interested in technological change because it's the number one. Uh, lever to address climate change, um, and policy needs to accelerate it, needs to redirect it. It's constantly going on, but it's certainly not fast enough, and certainly not going in the right in the right direction to to uh, avoid catastrophic climate change. So we need policy. Policy doesn't come out of the blue. It's politics involved. Um, I'll get back to that. And what we're also interested in is really this feedback loop. How does technological change actually enable new politics? You know more ambitious policy making, more ambitious politics, and then results in more ambitious policy and accelerates technological change even more. That's the positive picture. But of course, there's also negative feedback um, that, we're, that we're looking at. Um, so this combines like two literatures. One is the public policy literature, and one is this innovation literature. And today, I'm really going to talk mostly about this, um, this point of technological change and how policy can accelerate it. I will touch upon politics as well. Because of this interdisciplinary framework, my team is also interdisciplinary. It has um, like engineers, but also people who do policy analysis, so mostly economists and political, uh, political scientists. And we're focused on, on electricity generation storage and the grid, primarily electricity. There's a good reason for that, because most of, most of decarbonization will come from electrification of things that are currently being done with things like steam, <laughs> um, but also the up and downstream sectors, from, from mining materials needed, for instance, for batteries and so on but also downstream, meaning the sectors that use electricity, like, for instance, transport. And in terms of research design and methods, we're really open in our group. We, we, we're not like a modeling group, like let's say Jesse's group is really focusing on, on big models. I, we don't run really big models. Um, we're really combining empirical um, work with, with uh, modeling work. We, we work with, with other people who do make, make big models, um, like Jesse and so on. But I'll sh I'm going to show you computation models that we do in-house, but they're much smaller, and they're really focusing on, um, on, on, on this technological competition question. So quick motivation. <clears throat> As I said before, we need this transition, and it has to differ from past energy transitions. We've had a lot of energy transitions even in the last 200 years. If you look back like the um, early 1800s or so, most of our energy really came from traditional biomass. So that's 
firewood and so on. But then we added coal to the mix. We added um, oil and gas to the mix. Um, and with that, our emissions also grew. <laughs> but what's different now is, first of all, we need to be much faster. Right? So we only have this time scale is very different. We have a very little time if we want to you know, reach those internationally agreed targets, climate targets. Second, in the past energy additions, some people call it even not transitions, but additions, because <laughs> we just added new energy carriers, not really replacing the old ones. There are some examples where we replace stuff, like whale oil, for instance, because <laughs> we ran out of whales at some point. Um, but mostly, this is an energy addition story. And we need to actually replace a lot of those energy carriers, right? No more coal, for instance. That's different as well. And for that to happen, of course, public policy is fundamental. But how to intervene? That's, that's a very important question. And what you still hear a lot, especially here in the US, less and less, actually, but still a lot, I would say is, hmm. Why should we do this? And why should we also look at this competitiveness? Let's, let's let the markets just figure this out, right? Just leave it to the market. All we need is a meaningful carbon price. So introduce a meaningful carbon price. That's all you got to do. And then now politics comes into play, right? And then you see this, well, politics. It's not, at least here on a federal level, this get, didn't get passed. But there are other countries who do have meaningful. A few, just a handful, if we talk meaningful. But there are a handful of countries that have meaningful carbon prices. I happen to uh, live in one of them, not at the moment, but regularly, and that's Switzerland, at least for some sectors. So for instance, for, um, for heating fuels, we have about $130 per ton um, and going up carbon tax. And that's, not, that's not nothing. It's one of the highest in the world. Still. You think that solves everything? You know, heating, fuel, a landlord tenant dilemma, all those kind of issues? No, it doesn't. Because if you think about mitigating climate change not as just, you know, just an environmental externality that needs to be priced, but as a, hey, technological transition in many, many sectors, houses, uh, energy um, production, industry, transport, and so on and so on need to think about all the other market failures that are involved in transitions, like coordination failures. How good a market at coordinating long-term uh, decisions? And this is all infrastructure related, right? So it's all long-term. Hmm. So as one book chapter that I really like by, by Kenny Gillingham and uh, Jim Sweeney uh, at Yale and Stanford, and they, <laughs> it's like a really long list. of It's actually a matrix of, of market, market failures. And it's, it's about 30 or so, just for the energy sector. And one really important one is then the innovation externalities, right? And that's that firms have an under incentive to be innovative because when they're innovative, their competitors get insights for free, right? They can re-engineer your innovation. Um, Traditionally, most people think about this from an R&D perspective. So firms tend to underinvest in R&D because there's these spillovers from R&D, these, uh, these positive externalities. But what's really important is that a lot of technologies um, also have what we call learning by doing and learning by using. So building experience from a technology in the field or a technology in the uh, manufacturing floor. right? You learn a lot while you produce a technology, maybe. And you might learn a lot when you use a technology. Like, I don't know, this wind turbine always has problems after five years in these and these climates because of these and these turbulence issues. So let's design the next generation of wind turbine slightly differently so that we don't run into this problem. So what you got to do here is, besides all these other things like coordination and so on, you got to create innovation incentives. So that's interesting. But as we'll also see on the next slide, those incentives might differ for technology, uh, from technology to technology. And you might have to do this on a technology-specific level or more specific level. But then we always hear this argument that governments are bad at picking winners, which is, by the way, there's not a really good empirical study showing that governments, at least well-run governments, there's a lot of good empirical examples for you know, corrupt governments. 
uh, being bad, <laughs> bad at picking winners. Um, but there's not really a lot of empirical evidence in how governments are so much worse than markets at picking winners. Because you know, also investors sometimes pick technologies and so on that go, go bankrupt. Just, just open the New York Times today and you'll read a lot about FTX and crypto and so on. Um, <laughs> and it's not that this is like government supported much. Um, so what, what the answer to that is though, yeah, we just gotta be better about this. We just gotta think about which technologies are more likely to win and which technologies are less likely to win and how can we design policies that they are more likely to win? So that's what I call really technology smart policy design. Let's uh, look into how innovation works a bit more, um, but it's really just stretching the surface now of innovation um, theory. So most people when they think about innovation have this very linear picture of, or linear view of innovation in mind. So some lab scientists, be it here at Princeton or over at ETH Zurich or in a, in a company, right? They come up with an invention with a new idea, and maybe there's a startup or they, they, they license the patent or something to a firm. And then it, this new technology or this improved technology is being manufactured, and then it's being used. So in order to accelerate innovation, what you got to do is provide more R&D support from a policy perspective, right? So R&D tax breaks, R&D subsidies, those kind of things. And the, the, the um, economic rationale is really these spillovers, right? These, these positive externalities, because there's this disincentive to innovate or under-incentive to innovate because of the, your competitor being able to, to profit from your innovation. The thing is that this learning by doing also is really important. So these are these knowledge feedbacks from experience on the manufacturing floor and experience in the use phase. And this is also important, I don't know, um, some economists particularly refer to learning by using to a very, in a, to a very or in a very n narrow way, thinking about how the user gets better at using their technology. That's one thing. But what is, I think, much more relevant for most technologies is what I meant before, is data and experience points that travel back to the development of a technology, right? Nowadays, every wind turbine in the world, I don't know whether you have had the chance to, to visit a wind farm, it's a really great thing. And if you go to the control room, you'll always see a server rack with a server from the OEM, from the equipment manufacturer, that gets live data constantly from about up to 20 sensors per turbine, and not only for uh, preemptive maintenance, but also you know, to do big data analysis to improve the wind farm, to the, the design of the next generation of the wind turbine. This is data from the field. And this you cannot simulate. I mean, we can, it, we can go more into this, but I don't, I don't have time for that. But especially wind is, is very, very important. This learning by using was how essentially the wind industry grew. This is so-called Danish model. There's great, great papers on that. <coughs> so if you want to enable this, you've got to make sure that these technologies actually find a way into the market, right? Because only if they are being manufactured and if they're being used, you can harvest these feedbacks. But if they are not cost competitive yet, and you only have a carbon price, hmm, there will be no market, right? So let me, and that means then we have to maybe pull those technologies, and have de specific deployment policies for those technologies so that they are able to profit from these, from these learning feedbacks. Let me use the concept of the experience curve, which is essentially an empirical observation of technologies, costs, specific costs, so for instance, dollars per watt uh, installed, um, over its cumulative deployment. This is not time, this is deployment. And what we observe is this, this power curve, where the cost at any point is a starting cost times this deployment to the power of B, and B being this, this is a negative exponential typically, um, this the, being this, this shape of this curve, right? Um, and if you, if you go from here and say, okay, but this B looks different for different technologies, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a minute, then what does this mean? Let's look at two technologies, A and B, hypothetical uh, uh, technologies, which let's say are perfect substitutes. So they provide exactly the same service. I don't know, two different battery technologies, if you wish. And then if we now introduce some kind of policy, sorry, some kind of policy here that is technology neutral, that does not differentiate between A and B, 
markets would pick A, right? What, I mean, and that's, that's what markets are good at. They're good at identifying the, the lower cost solutions. They're good at short-term optimization, and that's, that's what they should be doing. So then technology A travels down its learning curve. But the gap, the cost gap, only gets bigger, right? Because nobody picks technology B, or only few people would pick. So what is that? Is that problematic? Hmm, you could say, OK, this would then result in what some people call technological lock-in or dominance of one technology. And that might be good, because then you know, all resources are focused on this one technology. But it might also be bad, because systems that rely on very few, um, on very few different codes, that, uh, that have very little diversity, are not very resilient. Right? We know this from ecosystems. We know this from other um, socioeconomic systems, right? Uh, oil price shocks and, and so on, right? We were just going through, which, or we were just going through one, let's say. Um, so that's one reason why you might want to diversify. And the other reason is a short versus long, it's an efficiency reason. And that might be, think about if technology B had this curve. Huh. What does this implement? This is, means this is where markets are great, right? This is the short term efficiency that they enable. But if B had this technology and no one would pick B, then you would have this long term inefficiency. Potentially, because you don't know necessarily at this point how those curves look like. So that's, that are two reasons to, to think about maybe we should support B as well and see whether maybe it's faster learning. So, that would be this um, portfolio approach, where you say, hey, let's support them individually, so B gets sli slightly higher subsidy or something, so that we can see that it also um, you know, gets a market and can profit from these experiences in, 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 on the manufacturing floor and, and in the use phase in the field. Or even better, if, it, if you care more about efficiency at least, let's support B only, right? If we knew that B has a much steeper learning curve. Gets much cheaper with experience. And that's tricky because you know, early cost data is very uncertain, and there's always cost overruns that had nothing to do with the technology necessary, but more with management. Blah, blah, blah. So it's very hard to establish good what's called experience rate. An experience rate is the cost reduction per doubling of a technology. And it's very hard to do to establish those experience rates at a very early point um, of a technology. But it's, so it would be really good to understand better what determines a technology's experience rate. So this is steepness of this learning curve or experience curve, and what determines a technology's deployment. That's another. That's if you think about the competition of technologies simplistic way, I'll make it a bit more complicated later on, you can really think about, okay, how steep are those learning curves relative to each other, and what about this deployment thing, right? this x-axis. So let's dive into this. Um, what determines competitiveness? Let's talk about this steepness of the learning curve first, and this is a paper we, um, we published two years ago. Um, and what we did is said, hey, there is some literature out, of, out there. But it doesn't really explain everything. You always find technologies that are not really fitting into this. And one of the, one of the things that you find in literature is technological complexity. It's design complexity. I'll talk about it in a, in a minute. And the other one is um, we found in this, in this uh, literature review that the need to uh, customize technologies to individual projects is really problematic. If, if you need to customize a lot, that means the cost re technology doesn't reduce much because for every customization you need to know find out new things that you can't that they haven't learned before right it's like going down the learning curve with one project and then the next project looks different so you jump up again and you learn and they learn and so on so it's more like the zigzaw which you know dramatically reduces the the, the steepness of the learning curve so we did a, a literature review on the conceptual literature but also um, the largest meta review of learning rates in the energy sector so it's 173 learning rates for 12 technologies. These are um, original papers. Um, and what you see then is this framework that we came up with. And we said, hey, these are kind of independent, the need for customization and the design complexity. And we, we drew this figure where we said, hey, there's type 1 technologies which 
don't really need customization. They can be just used in any application country or whatever, in more or less the same way. For instance, PV modules or uh, light emitting diodes, right? LEDs. And they also have a low degree of complexity. Complexity meaning how many components are there and how what's co being called in the literature, how integral are they? Meaning if I, if I change one, do I have to change many others? And do I not necessarily know how to change them? So a smartphone, for instance, is not complex. It has a lot of components, but if I replace the battery with, with a more powerful battery, I just you know, can plug it up. I can't plug it out these days, but I could just you know, b build a bit of bigger battery in it. It will work, right? because the interfaces are clearly defined. This is my voltage. This is the amps that I need, and that's it. But try to, try to just put longer blades on a wind turbine just like that and think it will you know, work smoothly. So for these technologies, wind turbines would be here. They have a higher degree of complexity, but they also need to be customized like to size for different winds and so on. And then there is this type three technologies, which are, you know, and, and the worst combination is then high design complexity, nuclear power plants, arguably. And then they often need to be customized, for instance, for regulatory um, um, reasons, but also siting and so on and so on, different climates, different, different um, exogenous factors. And if we now compare this to the actual learning rates, we find that apparently this explains quite a bit. Right? These, type one, these type one technologies learn at around 20% per doubling. So they get 20% cheaper um, with every doubling of the cumulative capacity. Whereas those um, type two technologies are more like in the 15, 12, 15% range. And then there is these slow learners um, type three technologies, which more like in the single digit, low single digit range. There's some, some negative ones here, even that, that's of course nuclear, which has to do also more, more with uh, also higher requirements for safety, which is a costly thing, right? Okay, so that's one thing. So apparently this combination makes, uh, could explain a lot at least. But then what we recently also found, and that's just a sneak preview, is because we have this big project um, with um, two former group members who are now both professors, one at um, IIT Delhi and now at Harvard um, as a visiting fellow, and then uh, Lynn Kark, who's, who's a machine learning uh, person. We, we, we applied machine learning to patents to measure complexity and these types of complexity. This is design complexity, what I was talking about before, but also what's called process complexity. How complex is it to manufacture a technology? What does that mean? How many process steps? So not how many components, but how many process steps? And again, how integral? If I change one process step, do I have to change many other process steps? Like for instance, solar PV manufacturing, about 700 process steps. And if you make this, the, the ing, um, if you saw the ingot thinner, so you have a thinner wafer, which is kind of one of the main uh, cost reduction drivers in, in solar PV, you have to handle it differently, right? If you, you have those vacuum fingers that handle the, the, the wafer, if, they, if the vacuum, the vacuum needs to be reduced, for instance, and then all kind of different, it's handled, like, as I said, about a, a few hundred times. You always have to adjust, and you don't necessarily, if, you, if it's too strong, it will crack the wafer. If it's too, uh, too little of a vacuum, it will drop, or it won't even be able to, to lift up the thing, right? And that's just one really small, like, easy to explain example. And what we find here is kind of the opposite effect. We find more, if you have more complexity in the process, that, re, that uh, uh, seems to be correlated with higher learning rates, which makes sense in a way, right? Because if you think about a very simple technology that's just produced uh, in a very you know, simple way, I don't know, a stone axe or something. <laughs> this is not a very complex process. It's not a complex design, right? Ah, the learning rate will not be high for a stone axe. Only the intraperson, the guy who makes this, learning rate will be high at some point. But, then it, but if you have like a very integral process, right, mass manufacturing, and you can tune hundreds of parameters, that gives you potential to become cheaper. And typically, what the great thing here is this is really global learning rates. That's the other thing. I'm not going to go into global versus local today, but, but this is super interesting. If you, if you know how to produce something cheap, you can just typically build the same factory somewhere else right? and harvest the entire learning that this one factory had anywhere else in the world. So to summarize, fast learning technologies feature limited design complexity, no or low need to be customized, 
and some degree of, of, of process complexity, meaning it's typically a mass manufactured good. Oops. So what about the x-axis? I'm going to be faster on that one. So first of all, is there a general, like that's the demand, right? That's the cumulative output of a technology. So first of all, what's the general demand for the utility of the technology, the service of the technology, right? Is there a demand? Uh, how big is that? And then, of course, how is the market split up into different market shares of different competing technologies? Right? If there is, I don't know, demand for, for storage, uh, electricity storage, how many, you know, what's the market share of pumped hydro versus batteries and so on? And that then, um, that then means, okay, if I have a lot of demand and if I have a lot of market share, I move fast on this x-axis, right? The second one is deployment policies, right? Um, that was super important for photovoltaics. If you think about this AB technology, uh, this, this, this uh, graph I showed before, <laughs> the upper technology PB would have been like, you know, almost at the ceiling <laughs> for just 20 years ago, and now it's the lowest. And that was, I mean, there were some niche markets, I'll get to that, but this was really only possible because of very strong demand pull policies. Greg Nemet presented here, I think, three years ago or something, in his book, How Solar Got Cheap. It's a really good book. Look at it. Um, I'll come back to it in about 20 minutes. No, not 20 minutes, 10 minutes. <laughs> um, and there's other great papers on that, by the way. So there's a lot, a lot of good work on solar PV and how it got cheap. Then another thing is other niche markets. If you think about how, how batteries got cheap, I don't know whether there's a book already on that. Um, I don't know of one. Yeah, I should write it. <laughs> um, I think, I think uh, Callie Gallagher has actually a book on it, right? So that's a great one. Um, that's a very different story. It's not that we had these super early deployment policies that pulled these, I, I'm talking about lithium ion batteries, right? That pulled those technologies into the market. It's mostly um, it's consumer electronics. That was the first market. The first, um, 1992, I think, Sony um, put this first lithium ion battery on the market, and it was for their own camcorder. Remember those? Yeah, you don't remember that. Most of you don't. <laughs> um, the, the older folks in the room might remember camcorders, right? You would, you would have a cassette that you know, would have to be mechanically moved and needs a lot of energy, and you had to replace batteries for every 10 minutes of film or something. And, and suddenly they come up with this lithium ion battery, which is lighter and has a much higher energy density. And of course, it was much more expensive, but people were willing to pay it because you know, the service was so much better, right? The willingness to pay was so much higher in this market segment. And then it moved on from, to other consumer electronics. Laptops was the next thing. And, Telephones, not these guys yet, but you know the old brick ones, and then um, medical devices and so on, and so on. So it was really niche markets that pulled this. And at some point, this this Elon Musk, I think, he, he took laptop. I mean, essentially the Panasonic laptop battery was 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 powering um, the early Teslas, and not not only the very first models, but even Model Model S to 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 some extent, right? It was essentially laptop cells. So that's another very important thing that you have to consider for multi-purpose technologies, right? Technologies cannot only, off, many technologies are not built to just serve one purpose, but they can do different things in different applications. And then, of course, cost reductions, because if something gets cheap and cheaper than the competing technology, then this means, ha, huh, I have a higher market share, right? This positive feedback dynamic. So models that project this technological competition, competition as you, we're almost there, <laughs> as you'll see in a minute. Um, need to consider all of these factors. So it's not that, it's not that easy. Um, if you look at a lot of models that are, that are looking into this, forward-looking, like, I don't know, for instance, the International Energy Agency, which is infamous for, for their solar projections. I don't know whether you heard that, but there's great, there's great people who always make nice tweets about it and, and so on. So they always super underestimated the, um, the uh, deployment of solar dramatically and overestimated the cost. And, and they're mostly um, um, models that are based on equilibrium, uh, solving equilibria. And then everything depends on elasticities. And if you're slightly wrong there, then you get into a completely wrong um, equilibrium. And then you tend to over or underestimate, in this case, underestimate the, the, the comp competitiveness of that technology. So we're not doing equilibrium models here. Um, we're doing something else. And let me show you, I want to show you, I want to get you through two models. Um, and some in the room have already seen this before because I, get, I talked about that in the team meetings um, uh, with Jesse and Denise. And, and then I'm going to show something ongoing on, on road freight. Um, the first one is stationary energy storage. 
And um, I like, I always show Ernest Muniz, the um, former US uh, Secretary of, of Energy under, under Obama. Um, he's a, also a physics professor at, at MIT. And he, he said, energy storage is the holy grail of energy policy, right? Because re cheap, uh, we've solved more or less the, ch the, the renewable energy problem, right? At least, at least the, uh, a large part of it with, with solar and wind. But they're intermittent, right? The sun doesn't always shine. Wind doesn't always blow. So energy storage is the most important or probably the most important technology to balance supply and demand in this world. Um, of fluctuating renewables. Um, and there's comp competing technologies, right? A lot of competing technologies. Um, the big incumbent in the room is pumped hydro. We have a lot of those in Switzerland, as you can imagine. By the way, mostly because of nuclear, because <laughs> we built a lot of nuclear uh, uh, capacity in the, in the 70s. And that nuclear is not a good technology to balance supply and demand, right? Un unless you're French, you don't want to do that. Um, and that's why we built those guys. And then we later made a lot of money with this because when you know the European grid grew into one big grid, you could yeah, take a lot of those German lignite and French nuclear plants and you know get a, buy a lot of electricity at night and then pump up the water and then make a lot of money during the day. That business model has totally changed now, and they have to run these things completely differently depending on how sunny it is in in in, in Italy or how windy it is in. Northern Germany or Denmark, right? That's a completely different. Like, if you look at how they run these things now, it's completely different than it used to be. It used to be like one cycle a day, um, and very, very simple. Just a way of printing money with your only asset sitting on mount being mountains, <laughs> um, and that's different. But then you have newer technologies. Like this is a picture of a lithium-ion battery uh, plant, I think, in Australia. That's this Tesla thing. Um, then we have redox flow batteries. I'm not going to go into the details of the technologies. Very different principle of storing um, um, energy. This is compressed air energy storage, and this is so, uh, sodium sulfur battery, and there's there's multiple others out there. But these are the ones that you can buy, right? These are all projects you can you can go to. I think um, this you will have to buy from Japan. This you can buy from many many um, companies. This you can mostly buy, I think, from the U.S. This you know, <laughs> some 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 companies uh, do this, and this is being being built always. So. Which technologies will succeed at least in the midterm? We can't do long-term projections with learning curves. So this is all built on learning curves. But we can do midterm stuff. And should we intervene with policies or not? For instance, because we don't want to lock into one technology, as you saw before, right? Or because we want to avoid locking in a technology that might not you know, be cheap in the long run. And now it gets a bit complicated. But I already said we have to think about other applications, right? And for energy storage in, and this is stationary energy storage, really just grid services, um, there's a lot of applications. And with, with some of them, you can earn money because you can also um, not only create value, but you can also capture value. If something you can just create value, depends a bit on the, on the regulation. But this is very different ways of creating value. And this is where you would put the storage, and either on the generation side, transmission distribution, or end consumer side. And I'm not going to go into this, don't worry. But the classic one would be wholesale arbitrage. That's what I meant before with this uh, Swiss uh, example of, of, um, of pumped hydro stations. That's one complication. So we have to look at t into different applications. And the other thing is niche markets or other markets. And for one technology that we're looking at, lithium ion batteries, this is, this is very relevant. If you look at, and this is old numbers, but if you look at the projections, this is going to even increase. The largest share of lithium ion batteries are not going to the stationary energy sector, but they're going to electric vehicles these days. Even consumer electronics is still bigger than energy sector. That's kind of flipping at the moment, right, as we speak. Um, but projections see this at, at about 80% for the next 30, 20 years or so, right? Makes sense. <laughs> You need many, many, many more. Um, at, I mean, this market is already very big. This market is not that big. But it's going to grow. But this market is going to grow as well. So we have to consider both of these things. So let's have a look at how we can build a model that considers all of these factors. So first of all, what we want to understand is the cost position of all of these technologies. 
right? And we're not looking at the, the capex, uh, but we're looking at the, the total cost of ownership, if you wish, right? The total life cycle cost. Or in this case, it's called uh, levelized cost of storage, LCOS. And all of these technologies are perfect substitutes. They might have different levelized costs of storage for different applications. And what's also important is you will have distributions. Not every, um, for instance, every user of the technology, every, every um, company that purchases and builds such plant will have the same cost. If it's small or large, that will make a difference and so on. The siding will make a difference and so on and so on. So we, what we do is like a probabilistic um, costing. Right? Levelized cost uh, analysis. Based on that, depending on how much these curves then overlap, we estimate market shares of those different technologies. So if there's, there's one technology that's substantially cheaper somewhere here, this will have by far the highest market share. If there's zero overlap, this would get all the market share, right? OK. And with that, we then move to the next year. So this is an annual model that's moving forward on an an with an annual resolution. This capacity that every technology sees in terms of added gigawatt hours, storage capacity, together with the capacity forecast of EV uh, uptake, remember for lithium ion battery that's very important, then tells you how much each of these technologies travels down its learning curve from this one year to the next. And then this then informs the calculation of the LCUS in the next year. So it's really an iterative model that goes through this until we just say <laughs> end. And we do this. We don't, we don't do this. I said this is good for midterm stuff, um, where we know experience rates more or less for technologies. It's really hard to do this for like 2100 or something. That doesn't make sense, because there will be, hopefully, <laughs> completely new technologies that we don't even know about. And we don't know the cost of those, of course. So you do this iteratively. And then what you get as a result, and I should have, this should have come later, as a result, we see this. So over time, this is lithium ion. It's, lithium ion is really eating into this storage market. This is new plants. This is, it's not, doesn't mean that you know, existing pumped hydro plants are going to, out of operation because of that. But that's, it's very unlikely that we'll see a lot of pumped hydro stations added to the system. Of course, there might be these parks. Like in Switzerland, we have a lot of glacier retreat, and now it's like super easy to just build you know, one more lake. It's, their lake is almost there now. You just build a little wall, and then you just add it to the existing huge six lake dam, dam system, I should say. And of course, we will see those. Um, but it's very likely that most of the prep project will be lithium ion. You also see that all of these other technologies, they hardly show up. There's a bit of lead acid here in the, in the past. We started the model in 2018. That's, Gone, right? It's really li li uh, uh, lithium ion crowding things out. We're like, okay, this is our most likely assumption. And let's see, it look, looks like a bit of a lock in, right? And you might have heard of lithium shortages recently or cobalt being sourced mostly from one uh, country in Africa, um, um, Democratic Republic of Congo. And mm, there might be <laughs> bottlenecks at some point. So maybe we don't want to lock in. Um, so let's look at maybe also how robust this result is. So we tuned all the parameters in a way that it's the best case for lithium ion. And then, of course, this happens from us even faster. And then worst case for lithium ion, which is very unlikely, which is really, really like, for instance, um, uh, an electric vehicle uptake growth per year of 14. You know where we had to get to, to find some external source to give us the, the OPEC? <laughs> it was? It was 60% over the last year, right? And so this is, this is probably, but in the, globally? Yeah. Globally, so this is even too conservative. So this is much more likely or even, right? We might be a bit. Sustained. Exactly, sustained is more like this. So I, I guess this is much more likely than this. This might even be more likely than this, so. But even then, even if we believe OPEC, the dynamic is the same, right? It's just postponed by, I don't know, 10 years or so. Um, so what does that mean? Should we care about potential lock-in of lithium-ion batteries? Maybe that's not so good, because it might also not become that cheap. Um, the other thing is, OK, how does that look for different applications? Remember that. And here we're showing um, all, the, all applications that are there. Why? Because every stationary storage application can be described by three things. The size, and we're doing it per size, so we don't care about that. But the other two things are the discharge duration. How long do I discharge my battery? in a cycle. 
is it like days or is it just you know seconds for some services? Um, and how many, how often do I cycle it per year? And then it looks like this because this this doesn't exist, right? You can't discharge for long and then do it a lot. That's why it looks like this. And this is how it looked in the past. So this is the, the darker the color, the more dominant is one technology. The, 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 the higher the cost advantage of that technology. And then you see those different colors are indicating the same technology. So you, you saw, OK, Pumped Hydro is really dominating this as long as you go to like two hours and up in 2018. And again, then it was lithium ion. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, lithium ion. Now if we, if we start the simulation, then you can see how really lithium ion eats into this market, right, from the bottom. Longer and longer and longer and longer uh, storage applications even up to 12 hours in 2030, which is, again, this typical day-night shift thing. OK. So what are the policy options? If we, should we care about this or not? Let's think about it. OK, one thing is, OK, if we care about a third technology, like a backup technology, because of all these lithium bat bottlenecks and so on, let's just do what the Germans did <laughs> with photovoltaics, right? massive deployment policies that pull this technology into the market. And we just said, OK, let's do it for an application. Let's do it for the technology that's closest in those applications um, where, where they're also the closest. It's a bit complicated. And that was vanadium Redix flow battery. So we created a huge artificial market in the model, just subsidized market for vanadium Redix flow batteries. And if you do this um, for 5 gigawatt hours, which is huge, which would be extremely expensive, then you wouldn't see an effect. You have to go according to the model in the, in the, in the most likely or the <laughs> specification, which you just say it might be not even the most likely one, right? You have to go to 10 gigawatt hours, which is enormous, and which would be very expensive. So you can do that, but it would work, potentially. But you might have to, if lithium ion batteries get even higher demand, then you might have to even increase your subsidies to just keep this technology alive, in those applications at least. So. Very expensive, maybe not the best option. Another one is too, and that's where these models also are interesting when you think about technologies that are not yet on the market, where we don't have experience rate numbers. Use it as a cost benchmarking tool. And here I have to talk quickly about Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> why? Because he's one of the, I don't know whether you know, but he invested into a lot of battery startups. A lot of battery startups that failed, or a lot, several. Um, it did, most of them didn't entirely fail. They are still like you know rambling on, and some of the stuff is being transferred to other things and so on. But but they didn't. They never delivered what they should have, and that was undercutting lithium ion uh, in stationary storage applications, longer term duration storage. Why? Because they were looking at let's say in 2017, they were looking at the cost, um, and this is like an eight hour one cycle. I'm just using this example, like a long term, like classic day night shift example. Oh, lithium ion, that takes about 20 cents to do that per kilowatt hour, to shift one kilowatt hour from day to night, if you want. And they were like, ha, we're at, I don't know, 10 cents. We're half of that. These are other technologies that, are, that were proposed. Huh. And we're going to develop this now. And by the time we're, we're ready, oops, we realize that lithium ion is somewhere here shooting at a fast moving target. So this is also important for policymakers, not only investors. <laughs> it's also important for policymakers because this is, this is not oh, this is not only you have to read the full paper and then you can differentiate between, then you know what these what these dots are. But this one for instance, that's not a technology that's there. It's a costing target of um, of ARPA E of the Department of Energy. And for an advanced redox flow battery and that seems to be like a good costing target for 2030. Because then, yeah, that seems to be OK ish. And if Dan can even learn, that makes sense. But if you have a cost target that's somewhere here for 2030, just don't support this technology, sorry. It doesn't make sense. Right? Because by the time you're there, the other technology will be already cheaper. But then you say, OK, but still, we might have this problem with this, with this lock-in, right? And this dependence on, on, those, on, 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 uh, on this technology. And here we have a third thing, and that is don't think about lithium-ion batteries as one technology. It's a family of technologies. In, in, in battery speak, this is called chemistries. So different 
lithium ion battery chemistries that rely on different materials. And what we modeled here is, so this is our expectation, by the way, this is um, for a, um, for a, um, this is now the cost. So in 2017, it was about $300 per kilowatt hour of storage capacity, and that would drop to 100 for, for a project. Um, um, and if then materials prices go to the highest we've ever seen for all active materials, we just use past data, then that would jump back to 160 or so. And that's bad, right? That's exactly those kind of things that we want to avoid, maybe. Think about gas prices. Um, recently or more, I think the, a much better analogy is the, gas, the, the oil price crisis in the 70s and 80s, right? When like, even the Germans couldn't use their autobahn. So you, you don't want that to happen. But look at this. There's some materials that don't really care about this too much, like uh, uh, lithium iron phosphate, LFP, because they don't have cobalt, for instance, which is a big price driver and which has seen a lot of spikes. So make sure that you have variants within this technology family. Maybe you don't even have to intervene much, because maybe the market does this for you, but at least monitor and maybe intervene. And then on top, make sure that the supply chains are diversified. And I think that's, that's great that the IRA, for instance, does this. Now, Europe, Europe and, and the US are like, doing the same thing. They want to, because I don't know whether you know, but China is really dominating a lot of material, a lot of metal supply chains. Not necessarily that it's all mined in China, not at all. But the refining of the, met of the metals is almost entirely done in China. So now that the met getting some, it doesn't have to be, um, there were recent papers on that, that we should not like, nationalize everything, because that will be expensive. But at least have some diversity so that you're not dependent on one player only. And that then, you just piggyback on the learning. But now you might say, yeah, but this technology has a different learning curve, right? The interesting thing is no, because most of the learning, or a lot of the learning, again, is in the, in the, in the manufacturing process. Right? And then you could piggyback on all this car market, which is mostly this technology, this and this. Right? Because you produce it in a very similar, in a very similar way. Some of these are also better suited for grid applications yeah. than, than they are for vehicle right. applications. You can so, tune yeah. to your assembly line. Right. You can tune your assembly line. You can, you can, that, that's the cool thing about right. If, if, if this, for instance, this is heavy, right? because it has iron in it. And it logically makes sense. It's heavier. OK, but you don't care about weight in stationary applications. There's less cycle life. There's less cycle life. You don't cycle as much as the car, maybe, in some applications. But that's, f that's great, then, because then the market will you know, keep this diversity up for you. You don't even have to intervene. Mm -hmm. But at least monitor this and maybe actively support some research that helps um, some of these technologies that, that are, you know, or some of these families, chemistries that are not pulled too much into the market. All right, the second example quickly is on road freight. Again, um, one of the key sectors to decarbonize. So within, um, within uh, it's about a quarter, I can't, can't read this, but a quarter of the CO2 emissions in the world from energy come from, from, uh, from transport sector. And road freight, so trucks, make up about 30% of that, right? And some countries much more. I learned about Canada last week. It's like. More than half of the road freight of the of the transport tr uh, emissions are from from um, road freight trucking. The good news is there is again alternatives to this incumbent, which is a diesel truck. There is, for instance, um, hydrogen fuel cell. There is um, um, what's this? Natural gas trucks, which are not necessarily super clean. <laughs> Uh, it's also an incumbent, if you wish. You, they, they are driving around quite a bit in, in countries like India. And then there's also battery electric trucks. Um, but the question is, again, which one will prevail? And that's a very, very, the other question is kind of boring nowadays, but we published this a few years ago, so it was interesting then. Now everybody knows, OK, lithium ion will <laughs> outcompete a lot of the other storage technologies. I hope everybody knows. Um, but here it's much more interesting. And if you think about Volkswagen, for instance, decided to get out of the um, uh, fuel cell truck recently with their group. That's a big um, truck manufacturer in Europe. Mercedes-Benz, for instance, is still pursuing both. They have an, uh, uh, battery electric trucks and still developing the fuel cell trucks. So they're undecided. That's quite expensive if you want to keep up both of those uh, development lines, right? Um, so we're, we're looking into this with the same kind of model. And what's also interesting is this is the CapEx. This is current uh, situation right now in Europe. I only have data on Europe here. 
Um, you can see that, and sorry for the colors that you can't really read it, but typically the incumbent technology, is diesel electric here in, in red, is cheap, cheapest to buy. Makes sense. But it's interesting if you look at, again, total cost of ownership. So um, per 1,000 kilometers driven, that's how you express this, you can see that um, mostly d diesel is also the cheapest. But there are some countries, like my country, Switzerland, where actually battery electric is much cheaper. Even fuel cell is cheaper than diesel. Why is that? We have the highest road freight tolls in the world, and zero emission vehicles are fully exempt. <laughs> So if, I don't know, how many of you, give me a hand, how many of you have seen a battery electric or hydrogen truck on the road? Nobody. I see them daily, mm -hmm. right? So this is also an empirical, like, observational confirmation that apparently if it's cheaper to drive those guys, companies will adopt them. Mm -hmm. They're having trouble now with getting enough hydrogen, to be honest, because there is so much demand, but um, but we see them, I see them, and I don't live on, I, I live, I bike to university, right? I live, I have to go through the city. The campus is right in the middle of the city. But even there you see them. And not only the small, you know, delivery uh, trucks, but bigger ones, really big ones, even on the highway you see. And what's the source of the hydrogen? The source of the hydrogen has to be green, otherwise it's not con uh, ah, considered zero emission. Oh, okay, great. So, but as I said, they're running into big bottlenecks there. There's not enough uh, electrolyzer capacity and there's no way to import this easily at the moment. Mm -hmm. So that's a big problem. Right now, and there's also only one producer of those trucks that's actually selling, that's Hyundai from Korea. Um, but this, so this is happening right now. Um, and there's other countries that say, hey, we want to do a lot. The, the EU has something, China has something. Um, the US also, of course, has, has um, wa wants to decarbonize road freight as well. So here the complication is that we're looking at really is global spillovers. This is from Greg's book, Greg Nemitz's book, right? So Einstein at ETH discovered this photoelectric principle. And um, then actually the technology kind of became, this was just on paper, right? The technology became, uh, semiconductors became reality only in the 50s with Bell Labs. Then you got this, these, these, these policies essentially that helped to drive down this, this learning curve. And everybody around the world profits from that because we all have sp uh, much cheaper solar panels now. So what about like the Germans, for instance? Those were fundamental in terms of their 100 billion uh, euro intervention to pull PV into the market, thereby taking out the industry of the niche. But everybody else profited, right? So how's, how about this um, in general and for trucks? So the, the conceptual contribution of this paper is really if one country, one jurisdiction P, for instance, introduces a policy at this time, T0, with, indicated by the star, and thereby you know increases the uptake, again, market share here, of this technology, which would have otherwise only you know, come in much later. How does this additional deployment in this country spill over to deployment in other countries? How does this change the competition elsewhere? Because, why is this relevant? Because we don't have, I mean, Denise just came back from COP, right? We don't have a global policy. Policies, actual policies, countries have to do NDCs, National Determined Contributions, and then policies to support their NDCs, their, uh, their emission targets, reduction targets, on a local level. It's going to be national policies, but we need to decarbonize globally. And the markets for trucks are global as well. So um, I think I'm going to jump over this. So the model we do here is, is, is exactly the same. Just one thing we have to introduce, and that's the so-called switching cost. Um, because the literature on these kind of products says that there is a switching cost. That's like if you run a truck fleet, for instance, or if you're a truck, a, a self-owning truck driver, you're used to this technology, you have a psychological cost. Then there is the question, how many charging stations are there, infrastructure, and so on. So we, we, we introduced a, an additional cost component, um, a switching cost component here. But the, the rest of the model is ex more or less the same as the, as the other model that I explained. We looked at the biggest trucking markets, so Brazil, China, EU, India, US, and the rest of the world we just <laughs> lumped together. Um, and we looked at those technologies that are already, uh, already introduced and nine application segments. So that makes this model also very complicated. Um, so light duty, three, three light duty, three medium duty, three heavy duty, vehicles always urban, regional, long haul. And then we know the distribution of those markets globally in, in, in those regions, in those key regions. Okay. So here's the business as usual, no policy intervention market perspective. So you see brown is diesel, pretty much dominated, but in the light duty vehicle and later also in the medium duty vehicle, this is until 2035, 
you do see uptake of battery electric. Yellow is, by the way, natural gas, so it's not really uh, helping much. So you, in those segments, apparently, there is something happening. Heavy duty, not really. Um, you see a bit of this slight green wedge here at the end. And this is fully explained by Europe. So here are the regions. Um, and you can see that this also differs a lot by region. Um, for instance, Brazil, <laughs> medium, no uptake, or also there's hardly any uptake here. Diesel is just cheap. Um, and they blend biofuels and so on. Um, so this is no policy intervention. Now let's look at how policy intervention in the US would affect the rest of the world. And what we model here is, and we started this project <laughs> two years ago. We would do this very differently now. Because two years ago, we thought, oh, what's the most likely? There's not going to be a lot of intervention anyway. Let's just model a carbon price. It's easy. <laughs> Whoops. In those two years, the world has changed. The US policy, climate policy world has completely changed. So. Um, Sorry for that. But so what we did is a, a, a dynamic carbon tax starting at $17 and one starting at, I think, $200. So this is a low and a high carbon tax, just to, to show what this makes. In, in the US, you can see then this is the, the business as usual of zero emission vehicles. It's mostly electric trucks. And you can see, hey, it pulls up primarily in the uh, mid -duty, uh, medium duty um, segment. And even in, in this uh, heavy duty, if it's a very high carbon tax, it goes up um, very high. But hardly any spillover effects, right? The green lines almost look like the gray areas. Only if there was a big delta, then you would have a big spillover effect. Mm -hmm. Turns out the US trucking market isn't as big as we thought. Let's move to China, which is the biggest trucking market in the world. Um, and here we, because we're like in this old world, right? China, they do a lot of different things, right? So let's do a policy mix, so all kind of different things. I'm not going to go through this for the sake of time. Um, but you can see one of the big ones is really toll exemptions, like the Swiss example, right? That makes a lot of sense, because in China, they have also very high tolls for trucks. And this, there you see some, some effects, for instance, here on, on India um, in the mid-duty vehicle uh, segment, or also in the US, and so on. So that would have some effect. Interesting. But it's also not huge, if you think about it. We, we did a few more. This is very fast. This is uh, Europe trying to push fuel cell uh, trucks. Just, you know, they're very interventionist. They like to do industrial policy. And let's say they, there's a big hydrogen hype in Europe, I can tell you. Not, it's not only in Europe, but it's very big in Europe, especially the European Commission, and also the German government, um, wh wh where a lot of the truck companies are. Um, so let's just assume they do a fuel cell electric vehicle only policy, right? That just supports this. And instead of this little wedge, you get to a lot in this segment, zero spillovers whatsoever. Right? So it's, if, from a climate policy perspective, not necessary. That's smart. And also not from an export <laughs> policy, uh, export uh, perspective. Yeah. So just quickly on this, on this model. So apparently, we need some intervention, right? Otherwise, we won't decarbonize this fast enough. Um, but especially in this heavy duty segment, that's, that's, um, that's important. But the spillovers, don't, don't, don't put too much hope on those spillovers, apparently. Unless maybe we have to form carbon clubs, climate clubs, on these kind of things. Like if Europe and the US did this together, they're always already allies on other things, like military. <laughs> um, and values, share a lot of values. Maybe that would work. Um, because then you have big market size, and you have, you have um, um, aligned incentives. So that's, that's one thing that we're looking at right now in this model. This was also one of the reviewers uh, <laughs> gave us a strong hint to do that. And that's a very good idea. Just to conclude quickly, so I think, first of all, a key message, you hear this a lot, all we need is a carbon price. No, trust me, I come from a country with a high carbon price. It's not enough. We have a lot of other market failures, unfortunately. And therefore, unfortunately, we need to intervene more. And that means, uh, but let's do it in a smart way, right? That's, that's, that's what I really uh, want to do. Let's just not be surprised that if we throw the same policy at different technologies, the outcome is very different. Technologies are very different. Then models like the ones presented here can inform, and, and, and inform such policy design. But, and that's the downside, they require a lot of detailed knowledge. There's a lot of data search was going into this trucking model, right? How big, how, how big is the Chinese trucking market in terms of all the segments that we model? How, how much is it going to grow? How, what's exactly the cost of a chassis of a medium duty vehicle in China and, and, and versus Brazil and so on? So it's very data intensive. Um, but it's much more interesting. And it's also not 
if you, if you just do these black box models with you know just some equilibrium, and you're so dependent again on these on these uh, um, uh, elasticities. Thanks, <laughs> help me out. Yeah, and then finally, that's a point right for for us. I think for our universities, I think I think this is super fruitful, but. I think you have to understand the policy or economics world and the engineering world. So I think really connecting those in our research and teaching a lot more is, I think, very helpful. Um, but it requires crossing departments and so on, which some people feel uneasy about. I'm trying to do my best, but um, it's not that easy to change some of the most conservative institutions around the world, namely universities. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions if there's still time. Everybody's exhausted, I guess. Well, there's classes and things. Oh, there's classes, yeah, you have to run. So what we model here, because no one's done, no one's looked at the spillover effect yet. So we said, let's look at the easiest one, which is really this, OK, how much? What's the effect of one country um, driving down the learning curve of a specific technology further than it would be normally on the competitiveness of this technology in the other markets? So how much more market uptake does, it, does, it, does this technology see elsewhere just because of that? But you're right. This is just one simplification, because what we've seen in historic examples is, like PV, is then other, other governments, for instance, catch up. Right? And this would then be the political feedback loop that um, I am not so comfortable with modeling, <laughs> unless it's an abstract model where you have you know country one, two, and three, and then we can you know do scenarios. But in a real world, I'm much less comfortable with doing that. There's people who do this now, right? There's this 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 um, what's her name? And and I think in uh, in California, um, you see, uh, no, no, no. Um, hmm? No, it's not Leo. She doesn't model. But this is this is IAM modeler where they built in po political feedback loop. She's a uh, Davis, UC Davis, but I don't remember the name. Um, we're hesitant, but that's on a very abstract global level and so on. But but that's the idea, right? If if governments see, oh, they're doing this. This is how they did it. Like the Germans only have this huge program because they saw the Danes doing this for wind. They said, hey, we want also want to do this, and we want to sell this technology to. It was a pure industrial policy. We want to sell this to the rest of the world. But we do it not only for wind. We do it for wind, solar, and geothermal, and da 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 da, da, da. Like eight technologies or so. Yeah. So we didn't model those. We also did not model. Um, no, I think that's that's mostly it. That's mostly the the missing the missing piece. But I'm very hesitant. But in in the end, this climate club logic goes a bit in this direction, right? Because it's like, hey, if we do this, look, you can you can f let's do it together or something like that. That's kind of a feedback loop. Yeah. Some are, you know, you have a manufactured commodity yeah. product that can go anywhere in the world, and you can that would get you know duplicated for replication somewhere else. Yeah. But others like you know wind farm assembly or other things might be mm -hmm. more you know, people learning yeah, yeah, yeah. locally and that's so that's 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 a good point, right? Problems. Like geothermal, for instance, one crazy yeah. example where most of the learning has to be local, right? Because it has to do with drilling and those kind of things. And if and it's different people who drill in let's say uh, the U.S. than who drill in Kenya. Right? And you won't fly in those Kenyan experienced engineers to the US or something. Um, but here, and then, so you can't use this kind of simple assumption for products where there's a lot of local learning. But for these trucks, and especially the components that need to get cheaper batteries <laughs> or fuel cells, those are globally traded almost commodities. I'm not saying commodities, but they're, they're globally traded goods. And therefore, I think this holds. But we do have a bit of a local component through this, um, through this um, how do we call it, the adjustment cost, you know? Because if a market is completely undeveloped, then you get this top up. But if the market then develops, this, co this, this cost top up goes away. And that's what we also, we have calibrated this on other technologies, but this is what we see, right? Because there's less risk with this new technology, there's more O&M services around, there's charging infrastructure or refilling infrastructure, I should say, to be technology neutral and so on and so on. 
So you get this, loc this, this component in there. And that's, by the way, then there's also application differences, which is also crazy. Some applications um, have, because you have very different battery sizes. So for, for a small urban like delivery vehicle, the global learning curve doesn't matter as much as for the big, you know, for batteries, right? Because there's a small battery in there, but for the big heavy duty long haul truck, that matters a lot. Yeah. Yes? Yep. Yep. That's a, that's a great point, and it's. I think that's a. First of all, that's a great thing because when I did started my PhD, like soft codes were completely ignored because they were such a small fraction of the overall cost, because <laughs> it was all in the models and modules. And now the modules are so cheap, right? Now we now we do uh, bifacial just to do a bit of extra efficiency so that the soft costs are you know spread over a, a higher amount of energy harvested. So it's it's completely shifted. It's amazing because it's, you just glue two panels together. It's cheaper, right? It's crazy. Um, so that's great. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, um, I don't do too much work on soft costs, but we have a learning curve on O and M for solar and wind. So that's a different kind of soft cost. And that probably you're referring to installer and you know all these upfront soft costs. So there's great work by I think Greg Nemet, Arun Vrai, and so on. And I think you can also one learning from the Germans, and that's not based on my own research, but one very interesting thing is there's a lot of competition. There was a lot of competition in the installer market, so the margins were, you know, they were thin. Whereas I think in California, there's, I mean, there you have Sunrun and you have Solar City and so on. You have, you have four, right? Like, yeah. Now it's, it's 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 essentially a oligopoly, and oligopolies will never deliver low cost, right? So um, I think making sure that you have diversity is a, is a big thing. By the way, sad story about Germany because we had this boom bust, and the bust a lot of those guys went bankrupt, and now the competition is not as big anymore. Now it's pretty hard to get your solar roof installed. Usually you would think it's hard in a boom cycle, but every electrician became a solar installer also. So um, on the O&M side, you can see learning curves. It's great. You have about 10 to 15% learning um, how to do uh, operation maintenance cheaper. Maybe one more question? Yeah. yeah. If you want, Rob or Jesse. You can fight over it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Versus, um, yeah. You know, cars that can high fuel yeah. And, yeah. 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 Question. Um, I mean, first of all, I think in the model you can build this in through these again through these um, through these adjustment cost. If there is no charging, then you have a big big top up, <laughs> and then it's not, then it kind of holds your technology back, which then again, it's kind of modeling the chicken and egg problem. So you can you can account for that in the model. That's the first part. In the second part, making this technology smart, I think these kind of models, if you know, oh fuel cell trucks probably, if at all, then only in Europe, only on you know special corridors. Let's not build a huge fuel cell refilling infrastructure just because you know our car industry or truck industry is loving for it. Let's maybe rather focus on you know very like really, really heavy um, um, equipment along highways to, to recharge trucks electrically, right? Because we know by 2030 this might be this market, you can also see the shape of these curves. This might be really taking off. And if we're then not ready, we're holding this market back. So it can also help you in timing for these infrastructures that you need to, to you know, you know to, to address those network effects. So great. Thank you so much for stopping Thanks by. also for the great questions. And, and don't be shy. If you have a question, come up now. Just send me an email.